Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a big honor for having Professor Brito here in this uh, inside school, inside São Paulo school. And the, the, uh, it's, not, it's no need for a long presentation. Uh, I'd like only to emphasize that Professor Brito is former, former president of Unicamp and currently a scientific director of FAPESP, which is uh, a key player in the, these issues of the school, scientific and innovation uh, school. After that, you have a meeting with uh, president of three state universities, and uh, the title of the presentation of, presentation of Professor Brito is the research, research landscape in the state of Sao Paulo. So please, you have the floor. Well, uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Amancio, for the invitation to participate in this uh, Sao Paulo School of Advanced Science on Science Diplomacy. Uh, my task here is, well, it's kind of like a message from our sponsors. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about the research and development landscape in the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And uh, I will do that by giving you some numbers, uh, telling you a little bit about the strategies that have been implemented and are being implemented in the state, uh, on, of which one of the most uh, relevant, because it's very broad in terms of fields of knowledge and, and objects, is a strategy on research collaboration, research across geographies and across uh, institutions. So, uh, I'll start by giving you some context about the state of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Brazil is a federative republic. We have 26 states, and one of those uh, 26 states is the state of Sao Paulo in the southeast of Brazil. Uh, the state of Sao Paulo has a population of 42 million people. So the state of Sao Paulo in population is more or less the same size as Argentina or Spain. And the state of Sao Paulo responds for about one-third of Brazil's GDP. One-third of Brazil's GDP uh, makes the economy of the state of Sao Paulo larger than the economy of Argentina and slightly smaller than the economy of Spain. So it's a strongly industrialized region which has a substantial effort in science and technology and in research and development. Uh, some indicators of that would be that 39% of all the PhDs that graduate in Brazil each year graduate in a university in the state of Sao Paulo. There are three large and very good uh, state universities the University of Campinas, the University of the State of Sao Paulo, and the University of Sao Paulo, where we are. And in graduate courses, they are rather large. For example, this university here, the University of Sao Paulo, last year graduated more than 3,000 PhDs. That would be one of the largest numbers in the world for PhDs graduated per year. The University of Campinas and the University of the State of Sao Paulo each year graduate about 1,000 PhDs in all fields. And uh, the State of Sao Paulo, or researchers in the State of Sao Paulo, respond for about 45% of the scientific articles which are published by Brazilian authors even though the population of the state is about 20% of the population of Brazil. So there is a, an over-participation in terms of results in science and technology. And part of this happens because the state of Sao Paulo has had for many years 
a policy of uh, using substantial funds from the taxes paid by the state taxpayer to support higher education and research. So on average, each year, between 12 and 13 percent of all expenditures of the state of Sao Paulo are done towards higher education and research. This is a very substantial percentage, especially if you consider that the way the tax landscape works in Brazil, the states are supposed to take care of the highways, the police, health system, schools for the kids, and on top of that, the state finds a way to spend 13% with higher education and uh, research. Uh, so that's uh, the state of Sao Paulo, and in the state of Sao Paulo, we have close to 70,000 researchers working in 151 institutions, and also working in 15,000 companies which are considered or classified by the Brazilian uh, National Research Institute as innovative companies, which would be companies that have ha had performed some kind of R&D in the three years before the institute does their measurement. Uh, an interesting thing about this uh, distribution of researchers is that, differently from what happens in the rest of Brazil, more than half, 54 percent of the researchers, work in the business sector, not in the public sector. This is a, an important difference in terms of strategies for developing research and technology in Brazil, because most of the national strategies deal with increasing business efforts in research, while in the state of Sao Paulo, the business effort is already about 60% of the total, which is not a bad percentage. 60% is the percentage you will find in the UK, in France. It's not like 80% like they have in the US, but 60% is a substantial percentage of are in the effort by the business sector. Then there are uh, 27,000 researchers and postdocs and doctoral students in universities and, re and uh, higher education institutions, and 4,000 uh, researchers who work in mission-oriented research institutes. The state of Sao Paulo has a network of 19 mission-oriented research institutes in forestry, agronomy, several in health, in technology, several topics. And in the state of Sao Paulo, we have some very important national mission-oriented research institutes, like the National Space Research Institute or the National Synchrotron Light Source. So that's the, the landscape in the state of Sao Paulo in terms of the number of researchers. Part of the effort which is done in Sao Paulo about research is carried by the Sao Paulo Research Foundation, FAPESP, is the name in the acronym in the Portuguese language, Fundação de Amparo Pesquisa no Estado de Sao Paulo. And FAPESP is a public foundation which is funded by the taxpayer in the state of Sao Paulo, so this is something that you will not find in many countries, but it is the fact that in Brazil, states found it necessary to have their own research funding bodies in parallel to the national funding bodies which are funded by the national government. So the state of Sao Paulo created this foundation in 1962 and the mission of the foundation is to support research in all fields. So an important characteristic about FAPESP is that it is a research foundation. It is not a science foundation. And the difference is that a research foundation funds research in the arts, in literature, in philosophy, in biochemistry, in engineering, in astrophysics, in molecular biology, so in any field, because our 
interest is in research. Uh, the foundation is funded by the taxpayer in the state of Sao Paulo through an ingenious scheme, which is the following. The constitution of the state has an article that mandates that 1% of all fiscal revenues of the state belong to this foundation. And the article also defines that the government must send the money to the foundation every month, not every year. This is a legacy of the days in which Brazil had a very large inflation rate and back in the 80s getting the money in January was completely different from getting the money in February, not September, January and February. Now it's a little bit better than that. But anyway, the constitution of the state mandates 1% and each month the government has to calculate how much money they think they made and send 1% to the foundation. And then the next month they make the correction if it was too much or too little. This is, has, been, has been working very, very well here in the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, on the one hand, the state follows the constitution like clockwork. So I can tell you the day of the month by looking at the bank account of the foundation. There's one day in which a lot of money comes in. Boom. Right? And they do that every year and they have been doing that each month since 1962. Uh, this allows the foundation to operate with a sizable degree of autonomy and stability. Autonomy because we do not have to do too much politics in order to get the funding to the foundation. Of course, autonomy doesn't mean the foundation is independent from the state because it's funded by the taxpayer. So it's extremely relevant for us, for example, each year to go to the state senate and tell the representatives what we are doing, why that is relevant, and why the funding is well used and so on. We also interact a lot with the government, with the secretaries of state and so on. So we're not an independent organization, but we have autonomy. Autonomy means the decision about funding or not funding a project are taken inside the foundation and not outside the foundation. Uh, and uh, stability, because we know historically that the state pays the percentage, uh, many other states in Brazil have this article in their constitutions because they copied what was written into the constitution of Sao Paulo to other states. But the thing is that in other states, once I was discussing with persons from the Gates Foundation and they asked, well, the other states do not have a legislation of this type. I said, yes, they do. And then they asked me, uh, well, uh, but the other governors follow the constitution and I was a little bit embarrassed to say that they don't. So I kind of said, well, they consider the constitution as a suggestion. <laughs> and then one of the guys, one of the guys goes and says, well, I can understand that. I work for the Bush government. <laughs> so that's a, a suggestion. But in Sao Paulo, it's the law. They follow the law. And because we know they follow, we know more or less how much money we are going to have in the following years. And if we do not use all the money by the end of the year, we do not give it back to the government. Whatever we do not use goes back into our endowment. So FAPESF has a sizable endowment that helps the foundation to go through periods in which the tax revenues fall because of economic troubles and so on. So, that's how FAPESP is funded. And uh, we select proposals using a peer reviewing scheme. It's not uncommon that we request the scientists to submit a proposal in English so we can use reviewers anywhere in the world. Uh, each one of the 26,000 proposals that we analyzed last year went to at least one reviewer. Many times, three, four, five reviewers, depending on the size of the proposal. We have some pride in the fact that the average time for a decision at FAPESP was last year 70 days between receiving a proposal 
and sending a letter to the scientists who submitted the proposal. And the success rate was 41%. In 2018, we spent 1.2 billion Brazilian reais, which would be in purchase parity dollars, about 600 million uh, purchase parity dollars. This money is spent, was spent by FAPESP funding fellowships for students and postdocs. Each month we pay 9,000 persons, students, professionals who are postdocs, and we also send about 1,200 persons abroad for stays from four months to one year. Each one of the persons who has a fellowship paid by FAPESP in Sao Paulo can request an additional fellowship to go abroad for up to one year to work in research that will help the project they are doing here in Sao Paulo be better. Uh, then we have what we call academic research, which would be investigator-initiated research. Uh, we fund centers which are funded by 11, with contracts for up to 11 years with reviews, five-year grants. We have young investigator grants which are grants for a young person. A young person is someone who has been a postdoc for more than two years, could be five years, seven years, nine years, and who is willing to come to Sao Paulo to start a scientific career in one of our universities or research institutes. They do not have to be Brazilian. They can be from any nationality, but they are moving to start a career here in Sao Paulo. We already brought a few thousand of persons who started careers here, some of them, most of them, very successful careers in science. Then we have a growing uh, program of university industry joint research which relates to the strategy that I mentioned in the beginning about uh, collaboration across institutions. We have several hundreds of projects in collaboration in which we match funds from a company. And we have a program that funds small businesses. Any small business in the state of Sao Paulo can request funding from FAPESP to perform research. A uh, small business for us is a company with less than 250 employees. Last year we approved 20, uh, 246 of those, which is more or less one per work day. So each work day a small business in Sao Paulo, many of them startups, got funding from FAPES to perform uh, research. Uh, so FAPES deals with basic research, applied research, academic research, business research, and all the possible combinations of those. And what we are looking for are at least three dimensions of impact. Social impact from the results of the science, economic impact and intellectual impact. The one that we never negotiate is intellectual impact. They have the projects must have ideas which are new and which are worthy in that field of research. Then, Whenever possible, we want the proposals or the projects to demonstrate either economic impact or social impact or both, if possible. Uh, in terms of funding, most of our funding goes to the health sciences, 25, 26% last year, then biology, and then if you add agronomy and veterinary, you will see that about half of the money that we fund goes into the life sciences. Then uh, we have engineering, then humanities and social sciences, and then other fields. So humanities and social sciences is a relevant field of funding for the research supported by FAPESP. And in parallel to funding research, investigator initiated, and all kinds of science, we have some strategic problems that deal with topics especially relevant for the state of Sao Paulo. Those are biodiversity, bioenergy, global change, and e-science and data science. Uh, in terms of results, for example, in scientific articles, researchers in the state of Sao Paulo, that would be the blue line in this figure, publish more scientific articles than researchers in any other country in Latin America. The other countries there would be Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Venezuela. And this uh, science is published in good international journals. This is a, 
small collection of covers that highlighted research funded by FAPESP just to show that you have many different fields. You have proteomics, you have virology, Zika virus, material science, pharmaceutical research, global change, uh, health research, cancer research, and so on. Uh, and I could bore you till late tonight showing you results, which I will not do, but I will just mention two or three of those. For example, researchers funded by FAPES who work to increase the productivity of sugarcane by studying the plant, the genomics of the plant, the agriculture of the plant, and combining those in such a way that we might be able to bring the productivity of sugarcane from the commercial practice of 84 tons per hectare up to maybe 380 tons per hectare, saving a lot of land in Sao Paulo and in Brazil. Sugarcane is a very, very important plane for Brazil. Some of you visitors might wonder, why is that they worry about sugarcane? Because sugarcane helps Brazil to have 40% of the total energy used every year coming from renewable sources. 40% uh, there are only in terms of in the, among the developed countries, there are only other four countries which have more than 40% of their total energy coming from renewable sources. Those would be Norway, Iceland, or Sweden, another one that I don't remember, four. Then there is Brazil. Uh, and as you see in the column on the right, 17% of all the energy used in Brazil each year comes from sugarcane in the form of ethanol that powers the automobiles. Many years in Brazil we use more liters of ethanol than liters of gasoline. It's the only country in the world that would keep running if all gasoline molecules would disappear by a science fiction act of some type. Right. Anyway, it's a relevant thing for a country to have their cars moving with fuel that is renewable, that you can plant each year, harvest by the end of the year, plant again, and which will suck CO2 from the atmosphere when the plant grows, and then emit CO2 when the cars move, and then suck the CO2 again, so it, that's why it is renewable. So sugarcane is relevant for us, is relevant for the state of Sao Paulo. Look at this. This figure shows how the state of Sao Paulo has made its matrix of energy much more renewable. Starting in 1980, when 62% of the energy that powered Sao Paulo came from oil, in 2013, only 38% came from oil. And in this period, the life of anyone in the state of Sao Paulo got better, not worse. So we used less oil and made life better for 40 million people. So we have a large portfolio of research about the Amazon. I believe that FAPESP is the research funding organization in the world that has the largest portfolio of Amazon research. Some of that we do in collaboration with colleagues from the Department of Energy of the United States. We collaborate with the research councils in the UK, with France, with Germany, and most of the research is funded by FAPESP alone. Uh, we also at FAPESP fund, as I said, re uh, research in philosophy, in the humanities. This is a, a nice work by Professor Marco Zingano from the philosophy department in the University of Sao Paulo about acrasia and the method of ethics, fully funded by the Sao Paulo Research Foundation. You might wonder, what is acrasia? Acrasia is something the Greeks started to study, which is a very, very present day question. It is, why do people do wrong things knowing that they are wrong? Have you heard about that? <laughs> right. In Brazil, it's very, very common. <laughs> anyway, so Acrasia. Professor Zingano is one of the major international world experts in Greek uh, ancient philosophy, and we like to have that in our portfolio. We do not ask Professor Zingano how many companies he's going to create, how many 
sick people he's going to heal, we ask him, do you have interesting new ideas? Did you learn new things about the world? And he did. Uh, we have researchers that we fund to study political science, uh, the inner workings of Brazilian democracy. For example, in this article, Professor Figueiredo and Professor Limongi studied presidential power, legislative organization, and party behavior in Brazil. It's probably not adequate for kids under 14, but... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we also work with companies. In this case, a partnership between FAPESP, several universities, including the University of São Paulo, the University of Campinas, the University of the State of São Paulo, to work with Embraer to build a new jet plane. And this is the jet plane, the one on the right, which is now flying all over the world for 100 passengers. Any airport in the world, you will find that jet. But the nice thing that we like in this figure is the one on the left. The one on the left came in the report they sent to us two years before the first plane was built. That was the model of the plane on the computer, and they were modeling what happens to the plane when it lands in the flooded runway and you want water not to go into certain places there, which is the, the jet plane. And when they tested it, it worked exactly like they modeled it two years before, studying the fluido, computational fluidodynamics of the plane with funding from FAPESP and with engineers from all the universities that I mentioned to you. Uh, collaboration between university and business has been growing in the state of Sao Paulo. This is a little figure that shows you in the blue bars how many scientific articles have an author in a university in the state of Sao Paulo and in a company anywhere in the world, showing you that this collaboration is strong and is growing strongly. Uh, and we have programs that fund research in collaboration with companies, which are programs that will fund for 10 years a center co-funding with a company. One dollar from the foundation, one dollar from the company, two dollars from the university. We have 12 of those centers in artificial intelligence, in oil reservoirs, in batteries, storage of energy, uh, cosmetics, agriculture, genomics, all fields, many, many things. And we have this program through which we fund uh, research in small businesses. This figure is showing the number of contracts we have across the state of Sao Paulo since we started the program, showing that this program populated the state of Sao Paulo with startups and small businesses based in science and based on uh, research. Uh, for example, one of our universities, the University of Campinas, boasts this collection of companies that were created by their students uh, since, let's say, 1997, 700 startups, 600 active, 30,000 jobs, 4.8 billion Brazilian reais, which is twice the cost of the university for a year in revenues from the company each year. And, for example, just to mention to you an example, you might think, what are those startups? So one of them, there, there was, at some point, we funded this person, Paulo Gurgel Pinheiro, to do a master thesis and a PhD thesis in a, a complex topic, which is cooperative multi-robot localization, and I wouldn't know how to explain to you the other words that follow that. That's one of the typical... Uh, scientific works in which politicians and others get together and say, well, why, why is that we are funding those guys? They write words that we cannot even understand. That's why they are funding, right? Because they are talking about words they cannot understand. They are talking about new stuff. So, Paulo Pinheiro studied the localization of robots, the planning for a mobile robot localization, he used the Euler method for doing that, and it's the kind of thing that you would say, this is useless, why is that somebody studying that? Then at some point he found that a motorized wheelchair is like a robot, and then you can not only localize, but you can steer the motorized wheelchair. 
And then he learned that he could use the expressions on the face of the person who is on the wheelchair to steer the wheelchair. And then he said, well, maybe there is a business here. And he created a company. Uh, he was funded by FAPESP to start the company. He, uh, they obtained uh, three patents on the system and they created this company which is called Hubox, which now has offices in China, in the United States, and sells this thing all over the world, which is a wheelchair that is driven by the face expressions. Person blinks one eye, blinks the other eye, does things with the nose, with the mouth, and the computer recognizes and drives the, the wheelchair all over. They also work with Johnson Johnson in the United States. So that's a, an example of funding science without asking them what are the applications and then finding the applications once the science is uh, created. Well, the state of Sao Paulo is a relevant science and technology hub in the south of the world. Um, it is in terms of growth between 1996 and 2013, uh, the science production in the state of Sao Paulo grew very fast. Uh, it lost to Seoul, Beijing and Shanghai. Those are not three cities you are in shame if you lose to them, right? But the state of Sao Paulo is number four. Uh, there is a good number of uh, investment that happens here in the state of Sao Paulo. The figure on the left shows that the size of large investment rounds by venture capital in Sao Paulo that happened in 2014 was larger than those in Seoul, in Paris, in Austin, in Seattle, in Mumbai, in Tel Aviv. So it's a relevant place. Uh, and FAPESP has been working to make this into uh, an internationally recognized hub by working in a very strong program of international research collaboration. International research collaboration, I will explain that to you, for us is research collaboration. It's not about sending thousands of students abroad. It's about doing research in collaboration. If you need to send some students abroad to do research in collaboration, that's part of what we want. But we do not want to be number one in the world by exporting Brazilians. So people go, people come, visitors come to the state of Sao Paulo, people come to be hired at university. Our students go and are hired elsewhere in the world too. Some of them come back. So our thing is, research collaboration. And uh, to do that, we have agreements with the most important research funding bodies in the world, in Europe, in North America, in China, in Japan, in Australia, in Africa, in the Middle East. And we offer opportunities to the researchers in the state of Sao Paulo through calls for proposals. Uh, we have been increasing. The green bar shows how many show how, many, how much money we have been spending each year in international collaboration. There has been a very strong growth since 2012. Today about 12% of our expenditures are in projects which have research partners. And you might think, well, in times of economic troubles they are doing that. Yes, we are, because it's good to do that in times of economic troubles, because a project that co you can do a project that costs two by paying one. So you pay one, the research council in the UK pays another one, and you do very bold research in collaboration by half the price. So it's, uh, it's very consistent with using more efficiently the, the funds. And one of the results that we obtained I show in this figure the percentage of scientific articles with authors in the state of Sao Paulo which had a co-author in another country. You will see that the line was kind of flat around 25% until 2008. Then we started our program and this curve went up like that, meaning that they are doing research together, they are publishing together because they are having ideas together 
working on the ideas together, writing the papers together, and getting to be published in collaboration as a result. Well, we have this program that I mentioned to you before about the Young Investigator Award, and uh, what I want to highlight here in my conclusion, concluding remarks is that we have in the state of Sao Paulo an internationally connected research and development hub with companies, with universities, with research institutes, with a very good supply of qualified researchers because the universities graduate a good number of PhDs and masters and engineers and professionals every year. Uh, we have universities which are stably funded. We have ways of stably funding the research they do. And we have an intense and growing uh, industrial research and development enterprise, either through university industry research collaboration and through a lively startup scene. New companies appear every week, every month. Uh, and if you want to follow what goes on in the state of Sao Paulo in terms of research, the Sao Paulo Research Foundation has this newsletter at this link, which is distributed freely. Uh, each week it goes in English, each day it goes in Portuguese. Thank you very much. Next, over there. Next question. You raise it. Yeah, please. In the state of Sao Paulo, as, as it, because it seems that Sao Paulo has a, a specialized sec, a secretariat uh, uh, devoted to economic development, and I was wondering if there is any kind of direct interaction between creating policies for innovation and development in the state of Sao Paulo and the kind of work that mm -hmm. FAPESPI has funded and how this interaction works. Thank you. The last one. Okay, please. Thank you. So I just wanted to find out, um, for the centers that are funded for maybe 10, 11 years, so when the funding sort of um, runs out, are they able to apply for another stage of funding? And if they're not able to, what happens to the centers like after the funding phase? Thanks. Thank you. So I'll start with the last question. The centers know from day one that they will have the contract for 10 or 11 years. Uh, when they get close to the end of that period, they can reorganize themselves, obtain other co-funders, and come to us to discuss the possibilities of having another life in a different thing. We do not want them to keep doing the same thing forever. So it's possible to discuss with them about an eventual continuation of the funding to do new stuff. 
then there is the question about the interaction of FAPES with the government. Yeah, that was. Uh, as I said, we, we work hard to keep the foundation in touch with the government, with the executive branch, and with the legislative branch. So we discuss with them frequently. Uh, with, for example, the government of the state of Sao Paulo sometimes comes up with challenges that they need to be tackled and in which science might be helpful, and we listen to that and we use those ideas to organize programs at the foundation or projects that could deal with those challenges. So what we, what we try to do always is to be in communication with them. And there is a challenge in this, which is uh, you, you want to understand which problem they want to solve. Because usually when the government or the state senate comes to an organization, they come with two things. They come with a problem and a solution. Because they want you to do the solution they dream it of. So we always try to separate the two things. So we try to identify the problem and think about how we could contribute to one solution. It may not be the one they came to us in the first place, but that's how it works. So we do that frequently. And the uh, first question by Laura was about the, well, you said times like this. <laughs> times like this. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, we, we are having economic troubles in Brazil, and on top of that we are having other troubles in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the thing is that FAPESP, on one side, the foundation by law is restricted to funding research in the state of Sao Paulo because it's funded by the taxpayer in the state of Sao Paulo. On the other hand, we know that if we can have more research collaboration with researchers in other states, that will help the science enterprise in the state of Sao Paulo to be stronger. So we use all opportunities to do that. And for example, when we work with a, a partnering foundation in another state, we never require one-to-one -one funding. Sometimes we fund nine, they fund one. Uh, we also fund students who come from all over Brazil. They can come to study in Sao Paulo, be funded by FAPES for a fellowship, and then go back to their states to be professors, to, to be uh, professionals, and so on. So we try within our boundaries to uh, collaborate to the development of the science enterprise in Brazil because that will be helpful for us here in the state of Sao Paulo and we can justify that to the taxpayer in the state of Sao Paulo. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Good afternoon, everyone. We would like uh, now to invite uh, to come up front uh, uh, the president of the University of Sao Paulo, Professor Vahan Agopian.
President of the State University of Sao Paulo, UNESP, Professor Sandro Roberto Valentini. <laughs> Professor Marcelo Knobel uh, from uh, University of Campinas, President of University of Campinas, UNICAMP. And respectively, the moderators, Professor Guilherme Ariplonski from the Institute of Advanced Studies of the University of Sao Paulo. And Professor Amancio Jorge de Oliveira from Cayenne University of Sao Paulo. afternoon again. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to be here at this important mom moment for the school. Uh, before I uh, pass the, the, the word for uh, presidents, I would like just to uh, present the inside at a glance some numbers uh, about the selection process. We had almost 1,000 applicants through, uh, through the continents in a balanced numbers uh, among South America, Africa, and Asia. Uh, also, we had uh, more than 700 institutions. Uh, students approved were 40 from Brazil and 40 from abroad. Uh, we had uh, good news about uh, gender balance. Uh, we had uh, female almost 15 uh, and uh, male the same, same number the difference was very very tight and in terms of academic level we had master 36 percent PhD 36 percent and postdoctoral 12 uh, percent but this number is is higher more than 100 postdoctor applied for this school uh, and others means people from government, for NGO, and others. So the selection process were very, very tough, and I would like to congratulate for selected people. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'll be uh, the moderator of. Uh, this uh, conversation, the moderator, is a strange name because, uh, as you will see, probably there won't be any fights between the presidents, so I don't have really to moderate. But so I'm just here to make uh, a brief introduction. The first uh, uh, comment is that it is a big um, honor uh, to have uh, uh, in this advanced school uh, the presence of the presidents of the three state universities. Uh, firstly, because uh, they, uh, the three universities have the importance that was highlighted by Professor Brito just a few minutes ago. Uh, and second, because uh, to become president of university is something which is not uh, so common, so easy. So they are the three uh, brilliant people that uh, have a lot of uh, capabilities that they will share with us. And uh, I won't uh, 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 present a detailed bio of them because it's in, in the booklets that you'll receive uh, or received, but just to mention that uh, from uh, here, first, Professor Marcelo Noble, the president of University of Campinas, is from the area of physics, and he has also some activity in the Center for Creativity. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Professor Vahan Agopian, is my boss. He is the president of the University of Sao Paulo. He is, uh, uh, comes from the area of civil engineering and he was the dean of the engineering school, so he was previously my boss too, so I'm already used to him. And uh, Professor Sandro Valentini is the president of uh, UNESPI, uh, the State University of Sao Paulo, 
uh, Professor Valentini uh, comes from the area of uh, biochemistry, uh, basically. Uh, there is another uh, second and last reason why it is very uh, uh, special to have the three presidents here, because uh, Professor Brito mentioned that 13% uh, of the budget of the state of Sao Paulo goes to higher education and uh, support to research, uh, for research. And uh, a sizable part of that, 9.57%, go exactly to the three universities. Uh, this is an impressive amount. Uh, and uh, the three universities got uh, this situation, which is not exactly the same as FAPESP, it's not in the Constitution, it's, in, it's a different uh, model. But anyhow, uh, exactly 30 years ago, exactly 30 years ago in this uh, auditorium, uh, not, not, not really here, in another auditorium close by, there was a, a very important ceremony with the three presidents to commemorate 30 years of autonomy, uh, financial autonomy of the universities. And the three universities have this the, the protagonism that was presented by Professor Brito. One, one of the reasons is the management, correct management, which was, has been uh, and will continue to be done with these resources. Uh, the three presidents, together with the Secretary of Education of the State of Sao Paulo and the Secretary of Development, Science, Technology and Innovation, they conform a kind of a, a council, which is called CRUESP in the acronym in Portuguese, the Conselho de Reitores das Universidades Estaduais Paulistas, uh, which has a, a president in rotation, and currently the president, if I am correct, is Professor Marcelo Nobel. So it's my enormous pleasure to pass him the microphone. Wow. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation for this important meeting. Another, I would, I would add some uh, other facts to what uh, Ari just told us. Uh, it's quite interesting that now, uh, in this table, by, by the three presidents here present, uh, two of them, at least, what I know, were uh, born not in Brazil. So, Professor, uh -huh is originally from Turkish, uh, from Turkey, and I am originally from Argentina. So, uh, of course, well, and Sandro probably is the second generation here from, from Italy, yeah. By the name you can imagine, Valentini. And uh, it's, a, it's an important issue, the, the, the issue of uh, interna international presence, international internationalization. But I, I brought here uh, two examples to show and to discuss. I will be very brief. And I would like already to apologize because I, I would need to leave maximum 4.15, 4.20. I was called to a meeting, very important meeting, in the center of Sao Paulo. It, it's relatively uh, close from here, but it can take, depending on, on the day, can take one hour, 40 minutes. It's, the traffic here, as you can imagine, is not so easy, and I must be there at five. So I already apologize to my colleagues that I have to run. Uh, so I will be really, really brief. The, the, the other part that I would like to share with you, it's b before starting, it's important to mention a few aspects that may, sometimes people here in Brazil that are so used to, to it, um, uh, usually don't uh, share. In the case of our three universities, the, uh, we, d we are completely tuition free. We don't charge anything, any fee for the students to, to be here. Not only the undergraduate students, but the graduate students, postdocs, any, any kind of students, we don't charge anything. And we don't charge many of the facilities or many of the the things at the university. We have hospitals, we have uh, a lot of uh, service for the public, the general public, the, the society, and we don't charge anything for anyone, and not even for the foreigners. So sometimes we go abroad and we discuss and we call and we try to attract the best students and the best people here, and 
sometimes I, I, I receive the, the question, why are, are you even caring about doing that? You don't, you don't get anything from getting a student from abroad. We don't get a cent. On the other hand, we spend, not spend, we invest a lot of money for the permanence. We give a lot of fellowships and so on. And the, the response is always, uh, as you can imagine, that for the universities themselves, having foreign students, having different cultures, different ways of thinking is the basic oxygen of the university. We need that. We need to renew, to, to have people thinking differently, to have people with different ideas from different origins and so on. And so this is mainly the, the, the main uh, motivation for our universities to strengthen the collaboration and the, in bringing foreign people uh, to, the, to our universities. Uh, it's not uh, a, a strategy from the point of view of economic returns, as it happens in other countries. For example, let's mention here Australia or uh, any other country that uh, works very much in the attraction of, of people in order to really help paying the bills, not here. Well, I would like to share with you, as I was asked about the inter some internationalization uh, aspects and issues about the, the university. And of course, there is a, a lot of discussion. I, I believe that my colleagues will discuss this a little bit uh, afterwards. But I would like to, to share with you two interesting uh, ideas. I believe, of course, I have a certain bias uh, regarding the ideas because I participated directly on them. But I, I think they are very interesting ideas in the way that we can really uh, think on international uh, cooperation and international uh, relationships within the scope of this conference that can really work. I would like to start by mentioning that we recently started at, at the University of Campinas a uh, refugees cathedra. The, the idea is that we have now in Brazil this issue that is really important in Africa, in Europe, and other parts of the world. And in Brazil it was not considered, almost not considered at all, at all in the last few years. But back in, in uh, it was in 2010, if I am not wrong, I was the vice president for undergraduate programs in, at Unicamp, and there was this big and huge uh, earthquake in Haiti, Haiti, and we, re, we then established a program here at, at, at my university by bringing about 80, 80 students from uh, Haitian universities that were completely destroyed. And this example showed us that it was a really important component of the university to bring these students and we felt and we uh, felt strongly the the uh, many, many problems that we have here with our bureaucracy, here with uh, the, the reception of these students, and with the, the huge difference that we will and we can make in their lives. So now when I started being a president in April 2017, we started this new program in order to accept refugees uh, from all over the world directly into, into our uh, courses, into undergraduate or graduate uh, courses without the necessity of going through this very, very difficult uh, entrance exam. The entrance exam in the university, just to mention, in my university, it's about, we have about 85,000, 85,000 applicants for 3,000 places. So it's about 4% of the applicants that get a place in the university. And of course, it's in Portuguese. So someone who comes from abroad, it's uh, extremely hard to get a good note, for example, in Brazilian history uh, written in Portuguese. So you can imagine that it's quite hard. So now we have an ad hoc system in order to, 
to, to see if the candidate is uh, able to follow the, the course. And we have been very successful. We now have this year 15, of course, it's not so much. We are now, uh, we have a total of almost 40,000 students. It's still a, a small number that we can absorb easily. So we have now 15 students with the refugee status in our university. We would like to increase this number and also to have more, to have professors as well from different countries that could come and help us in this, in this process. So I, I would say, I can tell you more details and, and you, you probably know that the, the history of these people who are in this program is really, really compelling. So uh, it, uh, we, we have now a lot of people helping, a volunteer team that is developing around that, and this is something that is probably growing. I would suggest from people who are from different universities, from different parts of the world, and even here from Brazil, that it could be a very interesting strategy in the university, and of course, it will make the difference for a lot of people. The other example I would like to, to share with you is uh, uh, going to the direction that Professor Brito started uh, to, to, to discuss, trying to make something new, something different, some, something completely out of the box. In the University of Campinas had the opportunity a few years ago to buy uh, land nearby the university. In fact, it's uh, together with the university of 1.5 million square meters of land. So it was a, an old farm and we had the possibility to buy it and we bought it. And we could develop a growing uh, strategy common to whatever all the universities are doing. We could build a new center, we could be, build a new faculty or whatever in the, last, in the next 50 years, 60 years, whatever. But we decided to make something completely different. The idea that we are uh, exploring now is to develop an international hub for sustainable development. So the idea that we had is to, to, to try to develop a smart city with the components at, uh, connected to the uh, development goals of, the, uh, of 2030 in order to make this uh, effort really, really different. So the idea is to, to, to work together with other international faculty members, other international uh, universities and companies in order to work together, always pointing towards the, the sustainable goals. And this is something that is quite interesting and nice uh, from the theoretical point of view and from the idea, but of course it's extremely difficult to, to make it happen in a country like Brazil. In Brazil, the, the difficulties to make a partnership between uh, a public entity like univer the, our universities and a private companies and so on and to try to make a mix of houses and uh, centers and uh, hotels and restaurants and trying to put every everybody together it's not easy from the point of view of planning and we, we, we are trying to develop and uh, discuss which kind of new, even a new law we will have to develop in order to make it happen. So we are discussing this idea, but it's, it's uh, another, in, uh, I would say, interesting way to internationalize, to make more international the, the perspectives of the university as a whole. We, we have good news in this respect. We got uh, a funding, uh, a funding from the international uh, in, uh, Inter-American Development Bank, IDB, of $1 million in order to make this plan happen. So it was now just approved last week and we will have the launch of the project in September. So 
uh, all of you are more than invited to contribute to, to help to this uh, international hub. If you take a look on Google, it's very easy to find Hub Inter International Hub of Sustainable Development Unicamp and you will find it. There are all the documents and contact and, and so on. So thank you very much. It's, I, I will stop, stop here, but uh, if you have any question, please do contact me whenever you want. Thank you very much. Okay, good. good afternoon, everyone. Well, I have, first of all, I have to say welcome to the University of Sao Paulo, welcome to Sao Paulo, and I hope you enjoy the university. Please take the most of our facilities, not only in the classroom, but outside the classroom also. Probably you have some social activities going on. Okay, right then. Okay, you are going to talk about internationalization and innovation which is a very important subject for universities. It takes, we need hours and hours to discuss these subjects, but of course I'm going, I'm going to summarize in 20 minutes, as I was asked to do so. Uh, first of all, I'd like to present some figures you know very well, but I would like to insist that the University of Sao Paulo is a very large research university, one of the largest of the world. So we have eight campuses with undergrad students because we, we have another 15 campuses without undergrad students, only for, with researchers and graduate students. Four large museums, we have more than 120 collections besides these four museums almost 90,000 students because we are in the middle of the year. At the beginning of the year, we used to be more than almost 100,000 students, one-third uh, research graduate students and two-thirds undergrad students, almost 6,000 faculty members, 40,000 non-academic staff, and cooperation with 83 countries. And just to to repeat and to make more, to stress the data that Professor Brito showed for you. The state of Sao Paulo is only 2% of, of Brazil in the, the, in, the, in the land. But we have 21% of the population, Brazilian population. We, we are in charge of 31% of the GDP. And something very important. In the state of Sao Paulo, we spent 1.7% of the GDP for research, for science and technology. The, it's far more than the country. Brazil is 1.1. On we have 74,000 researchers working in the state of Sao Paulo, and we produce 43% of the scientific papers. Only this university, University of Sao Paulo, we are in charge of 20% of the Brazilian uh, papers production. But University of Sao Paulo was born international. We started in 1827 as a low school of Sao Paulo, but when in 1934 we established as a university, we start international. Remember the data, 1934. At that time, it was very easy to attract young, well-known uh, scholars from Europe to come to Brazil. So we are very lucky to receive a large delegation of European scholars. They spent a few years in Brazil. Some of them stay longer. Some of them actually they moved to Brazil. So at that time it was possible to receive people from France, Italy, and Germany mainly, but also people from Poland, Spain, Portugal, few of them from UK, and few of them from USA. So we start international. During the 30s, the lectures were delivered in French usually. 
that was the international language at that time. Uh, these students, they, they, they live, the, the environment was international environment. It was very important for the development of University of Sao Paulo. But what I like to discuss with you, that internationalization and innovation, they may be a fashionable words, but for the research universities, they have a very specific purposes. Internationalization is an important tool for quality improvement. That's really a very important tool. If one graduate program can make a joint degree with a foreign important university, this is assurance that the quality of that program is very high. If an undergrad program managed to have a double degree scheme with a French, uh, Italian or Japanese university, is a quality assurance that that undergrad program is going okay. So internationalization has a very important uh, act activity, is a very important for the university when we have a quality improvement. And the same thing with innovation. Of course, we are very pleased when we can translate our research into practice. But at the same time, it's very important for us to have a better relationship with the society. The research universities need to be more, more and more closer to the society. That is it's a, a very important point for us in 21st century. We have to show ourselves that what we are doing, how we are contributing with society. That's why internationalization and innovation are very important activities for research universities all over the world. Let's talk a little bit about internationalization. The main goal, as Professor Brito said, is the consolidation of international academic environment at USP, at, in this, at, at the, our campuses. And we can improve quality and diversity. So this is the main goal. And the approach we use is joint research projects. So we encourage our faculty members to draw joint research projects with foreign faculties. Mobility, as Brito said, of students and faculty is a consequence of well-performed joint research. So that's the main approach. So we, we want to have an international environment in our campuses. And I'm sure that the research progress is, is going okay. Certainly we are going to have a high number, a very high number of faculties and students, undergrad, graduate, and the staff members going abroad and coming from abroad. So this, this is our major approach, this is our major uh, task. With, when we have joint research project, we have joint publications. And the joint publications is very important for quality assurance. Uh, I just give some data of USP. Oh, sorry. Oh, opa. oh, 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 oh. One, one is missed. Okay. Okay, one, one, one transparency is missed. Doesn't matter. Uh, I have the figures. Uh, our publications uh, done only for internal collaboration for ourselves. The, the, the let's say, the impact index is less than, oh, sorry, maybe this is in, no, 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 no. Okay, something is, yes, this is, okay, sorry about this. The impact index used to be below one, the citation index was, used to be below one. 
when we okay here when we have a collabor national collaboration, let's say among our universities, the impact index is closer to one. When we have international collaboration, the impact index became higher, sometimes about three. This morning I have the visit of the, the president of the Technical University of München. Uh, our impact index, when we, pu we publish in, in, be, uh, between ourselves, is about 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 uh, taking into account uh, the German university was 1.3, 1.4. The joint paper published from USP and TUM, the impact index was above 8. So, so this is a very important data. I'm just trying to, okay, now. These are very important data to take into account. So definitely internationalization is very important for education. It's very important to have the, the, this uh, uh, opportunity to change, uh, uh, change, change expertise but it's very important for quality assurance. This, just, uh, this data are just showing the how important is the quality assurance. Uh, we have uh, uh, more, uh, more almost in the last five years, almost 5,000 agreement with different countries, mainly with Europe, Asia and Pacific area, and North America. But we are increasing our collaboration with uh, Middle East and African and South American universities. And we are very proud to say that 40% of our partners, they are the top 20 in their own countries. That's very important data. And 44% of uh, papers we published are published with foreign partners. Well, talk, uh, talking about innovation, once again, of course, we like to translate our uh, the research results into practice. That's, that's no doubt. But our main goal for innovation is again, to support the society development with the innovation. The society includes government in all of the, the levels, the NGOs, the private and public companies. We like to show that university is a part of solution of the problems. And unfortunately, in several places, they think that university is the problem but we want to be the part of the problems. These are main uh, concern to, to show ourselves to the, to the society as a support of the society and not as a, as, a, as a problem for the society. The approach we use for innovation, of course, is the knowledge transfer and entrepreneurship. Uh, this knowledge transfer and entrepreneurship, of course, is a part of we, what we are, we are calling, calling now as a third mission of the university. The, university. Of course, the, the first two are education and research. And the third mission is to make this link with the society. And now we are calling this as a, as a part of strategy for the science diplomacy. Uh, once again, uh, I like to, to stress that we, we need, we are, we are spending public money, so we need not only to show that we are, 
we can help the society, but we, ha we need to help the society because we are working with public money. That's a very important point. And this happened in all of the countries. Even the private, the, the, as known private universities, they rely, they use a lot of public money for research. So we have to make this link. The action that we used to take is the joint research project with the companies, with the government. And if you have a joint research project, the knowledge transfer is immediately. Let's say you, you ask for the patent at the same time, in two weeks' time, the, the product is already on the shelf. So that's the main point, is if, if you manage to, to, if you can assure that the large number of our research projects are done in the collaboration with the industry, with the government, with NGO and so on, we may be assured that the result will be translated into, into society in a very, very, very fast. And all other, other, other aspect is the, is the environment, uh, the environment we created, the entrepreneurship environment. That's very important in the incubators, the, the uh, tech parks, science parks. And so we can, we can assure this, this environment, the number of startups, the number of unicorns, uh, University of Paul very pleased that the, the, in the last year we have five unicorns, four of them are from alumni of this university. So, something good we are doing. And uh, the conclusion, internationalization and innovation are essential tools for university development in 21st century. And for what we are calling science like diplomacy, to put in the science in, in, in the concern of the politicians and the society. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Amancio and Professor Plonsk, for the opportunity to be here and talk to graduate students and postdocs from different uh, uh, countries. And I really, this is a very good example of action of uh, internationalization. And, and again, Amancio, it's it's, it's very nice to, to be here and, and your idea to put this uh, school at FAPESP. And also the boss, and also the, the, the president of the University of Sao Paulo. I've been, talk, I've been, I've been asked to talk about uh, internationalization of uh, higher education here in Brazil or even in my university, and which is basically the same uh, to talk about uh, internationalization of research in the context of research-intensive universities, such as the three universities of uh, the state of Sao Paulo, USP, Unicamp, and uh, UNESP. The topic is not new, but uh, in my opinion, the fact that internationalization is an important topic, is an important element in the score of different university rankings, it has recently become a relevant issue of discussions or even a new area of research. The internationalization of higher education uh, and research in Brazil is not a recent process. With the support of federal and state funding agencies, and in the case of Sao Paulo, uh, we have FAPESP that was mentioned here before, and Brito was here, uh, scientists have established international collaborations, whether during their training abroad or in the development of joint research. This process, is international, this process of international mobility played and will continue to play an important role 
in the scientific and technological development of researchers. However, despite these connections being valuable and productive, they are developed at a more individualized level of the principal investigators and their uh, uh, group, with some exceptions, are not fully integrated to a more comprehensive and strategic internationalization plan of their own institutions. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, this internationalization, this strategic internationalization plan. In an attempt to gain scale in the process of internationalization, in 2011, the Brazilian government decided to significantly expand the international mobility by creating the mobility program known as Science Without Borders, in which over 100,000 Brazilians were sent abroad over a period of four years. Unfortunately, 73% of the mobility was concentrated on undergrads. The total budget, this was another problem, they spend a lot of money, of Brazilian money, the total budget of the entire program was about 13 billion reais, or almost 3.5 billion American dollars. This program has been heavily criticized due to the lack of planning and consequently the various problems observed during its development, among which we can highlight mobility of students with low qualification and proficiency in foreign languages. Brazilian universities played limited or no role in the selection of students' destination. And the last one in my list here was the lack of an effective assessment of the program. We, we don't have an assessment, we didn't have an assessment of the problem. We, we, we could not learn a lot from this Science Without Border program. In addition, this mobility program was focused on the individual training of the students without any relation with the internationalization strategies of the institutions of origin. One positive aspect of this program is that during this period, there was an intense presence of foreign academic missions in Brazil. UNESP, as well as other Brazilian research uh, universities, took advantage of the great interest of foreign universities brought by the Science Without Border program and began to prospect and propose strategic institutional research partnerships. In addition, UNESP has also organized a number of institutional and academic missions abroad that resulted in the strengthening of several partnerships. These diplomatic movements were critical to the challenges that would come when the Brazilian government launched in 2017 a new program for internationalization of higher education named PRINT or CAPS PRINT. This program was much better planned and is primarily focused on the internationalization of the Brazilian graduate program system with a particular focus on the increase of innovation, impact and interaction with the industry of the science produced in Brazil. The main distinction of this new internationalization program is the fact that for the application, the institutions, the institutions had to elaborate a strategic internationalization plan. And luckily, the total budget for the entire program is basically one-tenth of the, the uh, Science Without border, so it's around 1.5 billion uh, 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 reais, or about 400 billion uh, American dollars, million, sorry, 400 million which is much lower than the budget involved in, in the Science Without a Border uh, program. Of the total 103 proposals, 36 were approved, including uh, ourselves. 
institutions are now implementing their internationalization strategies. To facilitate the understanding of the differences between internationalization developed randomly or through a strategic plan, I usually use the process of, the process of mounting and decorating a Christmas tree as a metaphor, in which the internationalization strategic plan is represented by the properly, the properly assembled structure of the Christmas tree, and the actions of internationalization, for instance, uh, student mobility, uh, sign MOUs, uh, joint research programs, and, and others, are represented by the traditional Christmas tree uh, ornaments. In a random process of internationalization, in which there is no strategic plan, actions are fragmented without connections among themselves and be between them and the institutional goals. Institutional goals. It's almost like decorating a Christmas tree with randomly selected ornaments leading to a poor harmonic effect with large ornaments placed at the top of the tree and the tiny ones at the bottom. In this model, internationalization can be seen as an end in itself rather than a means to improve the quality of the university as a whole. Signing, signing co cooperation agreements, or MOUs, that, we, that will be kept in the drawer, and the establishment of partnerships without clearly defined goals are examples of actions in this model. On the other hand, when the institution defines a strategic internationalization plan, the internationalization actions, or the ornaments in the met metaphor, will be, will be properly selected and placed on the tree, leading to a more harmonious Christmas tree. In addition, in times of budget restrictions, and we are, we are living this this time of budget restrictions, internationalization actions can be better prioritized based on the strategic plan of that specific institution. The main goals of UNESP's strategic internationalization plan are to promote multiculturalism among academics and students and to increase the overall impact of science and technology carried out by the university. With that in mind, our strategic plan was aligned with the United Nations 23rd Agenda for the Sustainable Development uh, Goals. Seven cross-cutting research themes were then selected, and the best researchers to be engaged in the project were prospected in the top graduate programs uh, uh, at UNESP. It is important to emphasize that the movements of science diplomacy taken by UNESP throughout the years have also contributed significantly to the identification of international collaborators that were willing to contribute to our CAP sprint proposal. That was clear, clearly observed when the university held the kickoff meeting of, the, of our CAP sprint project, and 50 different partners from around the world came to Brazil with their own budget to discuss potential research collaboration with UNESP. Before this meeting, partners uh, were invited to access a web platform where there was a list of the themes and researchers involved in our project. They were asked to select one or more themes they want to be involved in, either to improve one of our, of our research strengths or to promote the development of a specific area that, although strategic, it was not yet one of research strength. It can be ex expected that this approach, with an active engagement of the principal investigator investigators, will certainly result in a more sustainable and long-term 
partnership as compared to those individual initiatives. When, the, when discussing strategic partnerships, the funding models for internationalization of academic activities should also be addressed. Co-funding is always the best way to go. However, for co-funding, a mutual trust must be initially developed, and again, the science diplomacy conducted by UNESP, conducted with our internationalization strategic plan, have played an important role in the process, so that most of our partners have been willing to co-fund our joint activities. We believe that uh, this was quite important for the approval of our CAP Sprint proposal. Selecting a strategic partner is also a crucial decision. Brazilian researchers are more likely to collaborate with the northern countries in the South and North uh, scheme, mainly North America and Europe, where most of the highly ranked and traditional universities are based. Although, although this trend will continue, in some cases, we can get a better understanding of common problems by working with the partners in countries with similar characteristics and interests. Thus, south-to-south -south collaborations, including South America, Africa, part of Asia, and Oceania, can be very relevant to find solutions for common problems and promote local development. As an example, I would like to share, and maybe, maybe we can include uh, 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 India, you know, in this, uh, in this process. Brazil and Australia, uh, I would like to, to, to give you an, an access, successful approach. We started with Australian universities a few years ago, before CAP Sprinting came out. Brazil and Australia have a lot in common. They are both young countries, with similar climate and huge biodiversity. They are also commodity countries and share similar environment issues. To start building these partnerships, in 2014, a delegation of eight academics from UNESP, including myself, visited some research-intensive Australian universities. During the visit, we had the opportunity to discuss common research interests and potential areas for collaboration. Since then, many joint activities have been co-organized and co-funded, such as workshops, academic and student exchanges, and collaborative research grants. Six years have passed since our first contact with Australian universities, and I'm very pleased with the outcomes of these partnerships. For instance, the number of co-authored papers involving researchers from UNASP and Australian universities has significantly increased since 2013, jumping from 45 to 178 joint publications last year, almost a threefold increase. And as Vaha mentioned, in addition, in addition, when we look at the joint co-author publications between Brazil and Australian researchers, they have much higher average impact, around five, than the respective impact of each country. To get to this point, seed money or glue money from internal and external sources have played a very important role in the initial phase of collaborations with Australian partners. For instance, since 2013, we have approved 18 FAPESP sprint proposals involving academic exchange between UNESP and Australian universities. What we are seeing here is an example of a win-win uh, collaboration. As a consequence of this bridge built between UNESP and the Australian universities, mainly the University of Queensland, that is our uh, strategic partner in Australia, a trilateral partnership named Global Bioeconomy Alliance involving the University of Queensland, the Technic University of 
Munich, I don't know how to pronounce correctly, Munch, Munch, and, uh, and UNESP has been established to discuss potential cooperation in the field of bioeconomy. So I, have, I had the chance to, uh, uh, he met uh, Varane in the morning, I had the chance uh, to have a lunch with the president of TUN, and, and we discussed a lot of, about this trilateral, and now we are planning to expand and, and get some money from the European Union, and that's why maybe we can include India in this uh, more than trilateral uh, cooperation agreement. Um, recently, a joint proposal has been approved by the Bavaria University Center for uh, Latin America and FAPESP, in which a workshop on bioeconomy will take place in Brazil next month with participants from the three institutions. It's going to be maybe similar to this one. The topic is going to be bioeconomy, and we are going to have uh, 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 graduate students and postdocs and also academics from the three universities. We are going to get together here uh, in Ubatuba, and we're going to spend one week talking about uh, bioeconomy. I'm looking forward to seeing these partnerships moving to the next level in the near future with our researchers collaborating in more robust projects funded by international funding agencies in the USA, Europe, Asia, and also here uh, in Brazil. I hope that issues addressed here may contribute to the discussions on how important uh, science diplomacy is in the context of the internationalization of higher education systems, not only here in Brazil, but uh, elsewhere. Uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, so you're going to be here. Uh, thank you, Professor Sandro Valentini. Thank you, Professor Vahan. Uh, we thank already Professor Marcelo Nobel, um, we have uh, now issues that, if I understand, Professor Vahan has a meeting now, and Professor Sandro... I, I like know. the discussion. I think we okay. can take at least a few questions. So, so if Professor Vahan... So we, we uh, agree we can take uh, sure. SES to leave before. If there is a specific question for Professor Vahan, we can take one or maximum two sh very short questions. Professor Sandro is so kind to be here. And if there will be other questions, more questions, including to Professor Marcelo Nobel, uh, we'll ask you to send them to Professor Amancio and he'll be, uh, or, or Gabriela, and uh, we'll take care that the president receives them. Uh, uh, questions and as you see they are very kind and, and uh, interested in, in uh, using this opportunity to increase the uh, uh, density of cooperation uh, with your presence here. So I don't know who has a microphone, Gabriela. Uh, two questions, one after the other, short questions. Uh, well, Gabriela decides. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank all our distinguished speakers. I'm Angelina Hovanesian from Armenia. Uh, I have a question. Armenia. While estimating your job and working responsibilities, uh, uh, how many percentages go to management? How many go to science and research, to problem solving or creative thinking? And my second question, just a short uh, one. Uh, during these days, what is the international priorities for uh, each of your universities? I mean, for international cooperation. Thank you. Let's use. Yeah. 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 Let's hear a second question, and then we'll have the answer first, the Professor Vahan. And. Uh, Okay. Uh, thank you so much. It's, it's nice to have leaders of academic institution in one platform to ask this question. Um, I, I have two quick questions, maybe many, but this is most important. What is your opinion about uh, the international ranking of an academic institution? How much importance as a leader of an institute you give in drafting the strategies for your institutions? Another a second part of this question is sometimes you have national interest 
to draft internationalization strategy. At the same time, you have curiosity-driven interest from your faculties. Professors have their own interest to collaborate with specific. How do you make the balance? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the questions. Professor Vahan, please first. So you All right. Just to start your final. Uh, of course, we have uh, the faculties, they have their, their, their freedom to do what they wanted, and we are very proud to keep this, the faculty freedom, the, the chair freedom. So they do what they wanted. So if they have their own strategies, we do not discover. You, you, you see, the, we have more than 1,000 agreements per year. And most of them are, are done by their own, for, by the faculties. We have some specific uh, curiosity, specific I idea. For instance, you know, someone who is studying ancient history may be very interesting to have a, an, an agreement with, with your university. Some, someone who is studying something else from something uh, social aspect or religion, something they can have some their own activities. So we do not uh, restrict any, any things. What she, she asked me is, is, what are the institutional priorities? So in institutional priorities, of course, you have to, to, to design, you have to plan, you have to organize, discussing with, with, uh, with your staff. Uh, but uh, originally, uh, University of São Paulo, as Sandro mentioned, and, and other Brazilian universities, we have a very close link with uh, Europe and USA. Uh, and I mentioned that uh, very strong links. So let's just say we, if we publish 200 papers with, uh, with uh, TUM, we used to publish 2,000 uh, papers with Stanford so, per year. So it, it, that, that's the difference. So we decided, first of all, to have to increase our links with Latin America. So Bra University of Sao Paulo, is now we're talking about University of Sao Paulo, decided to to make it stronger their activities with Latin America. So we signed a very, very uh, important agreement with University of Mexico, UNAM, and University of Buenos Aires. And at the same time, we organize the macro, the Latin American universities are very large. So we have a macro universities uh, union, and we uh, have a mobility of undergrad and graduate students among these universities. At the beginning, we have the support for of, of some grant from a company, from a bank, and now we are, uh, we are supporting ourselves. Uh, now we decided to increase our links with Asia and with, uh, with, with uh, that area because we used to have a very strong and we have, still have very strong link with Japan because we have a very large Japanese uh, uh, community in Brazil, in Sao Paulo mainly, but we, we, we decided that we have to, to go more closer to China, India, uh, a specific area. So, Probably last year, my staff and I, we are going to visit a, few, a couple of times this area to increase our links. So that, that's, that's the point we are taking, taking care. So as an institution, now we are prioritizing, we have our priorities Latin America and we're increasing our activities in Latin America. And for the nec next year, we, we start to increase our activities in uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, let's say Pacific area, Pacific area. Uh, you you may you make me another question. I forget it. Sorry. Uh, when you call ma management, let's say it's from the 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 principal office, we used to have. Uh, let's say, the, the, we have some financial problems in the last few years. So we decided to do a, a volunteer uh, retirement uh, process. And we managed to reduce about 4,000 non-academic staff. So we used to have 18,000 non-academic staff, non staff, and now we reduced to 14,000. The number of faculties, no, we keep the same. Uh, this and we, with this reduction, the, 
the main uh, activities, the main uh, efforts are done to reduce the administrative activities inside the university. So we are joining the uh, administrative uh, uh, positions in, at the university. I d don't have a, a proper figure, but I just show you an example. The, the central administration used to have 1,500 uh, non, uh, staff, and now we have 700, less than half. But, I, uh, but our major, uh, we, we run some hospitals, so we have a lot of people working in the hospital. For instance, this hospital here, I don't want you to, 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 to visit it, but if, if it's necessary, this hospital has 2,500, uh, oh, sorry, now it's 2,000 uh, workers. So you have some, you know, some hospitals to be to done that. All right. That's, I, I ask you to actually to enjoy our facilities, but not the hospital itself. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much to attend this meeting. Congratulations to the organizers, and I hope you enjoy yourself, as I mentioned. And I was really, uh, I was honest. In, really enjoy yourself. Use our facilities, visit our museums. They are very nice uh, uh, cultural areas. And enjoy the city of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is a l very large city also, but we, we have a very good cultural activities, a large number of cultural act activities. I am going to visit uh, Yerevan in the centenary festivities next month. <laughs> okay, enjoy yourself. I, I just want to compliment one of the answers. I think the reduction in numbers of people, um, it's, of course, it's, it's a problem, a, a financial problem, but uh, in my opinion, uh, it's really important to, to get more well-trained people. As you know, we are in public institutions. We cannot fire. It's really hard to fire someone. So, completely different from private uh, institutions. So, I think now we are trying to hire someone much more well-trained. For instance, um, in my case, I have a very small uh, office for international relations, but I try to keep those five or six people that are very, very good in this uh, diplomacy, in this uh, uh, international relation. But uh, I think, and also, uh, computers and other abilities are necessary, and then we can replace the reduction of uh, uh, people with more well-trained people and prepared people uh, to work at the universities. And I think there's a, a common question uh, between the two, and I think the strategy, I, I try to explain uh, our strategy, but uh, we, we don't look at the ranks. I think uh, we have this bias with the international ranks. We look for people that really want to get together and work. I really don't like to sign MOUs that it doesn't mean anything, that are, that are kept in the drawer, uh, as I mentioned. We need to look at people that want to work together in, in common themes. That's why we decided to align our goals with the, the sustainable development goals by United, uh, by, in the agenda of United Nations. And those, those problems are common problems everywhere in the world. So we select seven of them and we put in our strategic plan. So we are looking for people around the world that want to work on those specific themes. And that's why we have missions. Usually, uh, I cannot go every, in every mission. I just returned from a mission from Israel. And we were looking for partners, strategic partners. So I, I mentioned here the Australia. So we spent a lot, five years to select one specific university at, at, in Australia because they, we, we developed trust 
When we were there, they, they came here. We put academics together to talk about uh, different problems. And so now we are having the, the good results. So we did the same with different countries. And as I, I mentioned, I don't have this bias with South and North. I, I did all my training in the United States. But I think we need to put more people working together uh, in the South-South uh, uh, also in the South-South. For instance, we don't work too much with not our neighbors. We need to put, more, uh, to put together people from Latin, researchers from Latin America to work together because we have specific and common problems here. That's why we, in, in the case of Australia, we, we have a lot of incomes. We, in my school, we have like five agricultural uh, units and three vet science, veterinary science units. So we do have common, and I think we can put people to work together, independent of the international academic uh, rankings. Unfortunately, we do have a lot of people that, first of all, look at the rank. And, and I completely disagree with that. I was talking to the, to the especially because in, in the three of us, my university is the youngest and, there is, and has a completely different history. So I was talking to the rector of, or the president of the, the Technological University of Munich, and he has the same ideas. You know, we need to, to try to find in every country partners, partners to solve problems, especially in the case of the three here, because we are public. As, as uh, 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 Brito mentioned, we, we get like, uh, together with uh, Australia, uh, uh, FAPESP and other institutions, research institutions, we get every year 13 billion reais of our local currency. This is a lot of money. We need to develop, to solve problems and give this back to the population. And I'm quite sure that we have a lot of population in different countries suffering from the same problems, and we need to focus on that problems. Thank you. Uh, we are, I'm not sure, how is our time? I think we finished. Is, is it possible, Professor? Sand okay, we'll have uh, two questions more. Uh, 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 Gabriela manages, and then I'll. Hello, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm Daniel here from Brazil, but working for the European Commission Initiative, uh, EURAXIS. And I would like uh, to ask about brain drain. We, we talked a lot about the subject uh, during the past uh, week. And now that the situation politically and economically in Brazil is more unstable, let's say, the risk of having uh, excellent personnel and human resources leaving the country to pursue a career outside of Brazil and maybe do not cooperate anymore with institutions because sometimes you can be outside and cooperate with institutions here uh, is a greater his risk for the moment. Uh, in your uh, position of a president of a university, do you see this as a current problem? Uh, do you think the universities, the Brazilian universities are already taking measures um, to halt or to deal with this type of problems? And uh, in Specifically regarding this subject, the, do UNESP or do you think that the other universities from Sao Paulo have alumni networks that are active and if they do activities or if there is a planning uh, to develop a network of this sense? Next question. The second part. Hi, Professor Valentini. Um, my name is Anthony um, from the University of Newcastle, Australia. Um, so. I mean, I've just learned from you that you sort of collaborate with the University of Queensland, uh, an amazing university, obviously. Um, I come from a center, a global center that is, you know, really focused on environmental contamination, risk assessment and remediation of the environment, which is particularly important, you know, to, the, to one of the SDGs. So I'm just, this is just like a first note to like, you know, Perhaps UNESP would be also in interested in exploring potential collaboration in that area 
So you, I mean, we could look at you know, potential collaboration with the University of Newcastle as well. But my key question is that I've always thought that quality education um, could not be free. So for a developing country like Brazil, I'm, I'm, I'm actually surprised because coming to this university, this, uh, all the facilities I've experienced so far has been so amazing. So I'm like, how is it possible that education is free? How is it, how, how is it possible that it's free and, and um, you, uh, are there times when you become overwhelmed, you know, from a financial perspective? Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I'm passing to Professor Valentini, but I cannot lose the opportunity to say that this is a six million dollar question. Very tricky question uh, right now, but uh, I'm not scared of, you know, saying what I have in my mind, and that's why I'm in this position. And I'm going to start with uh, the brain drain. Uh, sure, I agree completely with you. And, uh, and uh, in the state of Sao Paulo, the situation, as you know, and from Brito's talk, everyone knows that the situation is completely different. At least here, uh, we have very good labs, we have a very good inf infrastructure and to keep uh, our graduate students and postdocs. And, uh, and in the rest of the country, it's not the same, in the sa it's not in the same level. But uh, I'd like to talk, I don't know if you are aware of that, and I keep telling this, uh, we, ha we have a very bad problem, and is related to the salary that we have to pay here in the three state universities. And this is, is gonna uh, completely, in my opinion, in the next decades, if anything changes, we are going to destroy this system. The system, the higher education system in the state of Sao Paulo, took us 85 years to be built. Starting from 1934, the University of Sao Paulo was the first, just after the revolution in 1932. And at that time, we lost that it was not a big uh, uh, movement, but it was like a big fight in the country. And we lost that fight, the people from Sao Paulo, but we decided to focus in the future. We decided to focus in science and technology. And that's why after 85 years, we have three very good universities, research intensive universities, and the foundation. And this is really important, and now they are trying to block our increase in salary uh, with, not the salary, but the money that the governor of the state receives every month. But of course, this money, I can tell you the, the amount of money. It's really hard uh, to talk about salary in a developing country, and specifically in this time of the we are in this terrible uh, financial crisis, but we need to talk about this because, look, one, uh, one PhD student, when just finish uh, the PhD, if he decides to join, join one of the three universities, his, he or she is going to start uh, receiving around 11,000 uh, reais. You can divide it by four and see how much in American dollars. So, and then you have to, to keep your motivation, your career, traveling to other countries, doing your postdocs, and we have two other um, steps. steps, big steps. Uh, it's like uh, you have to, to apply for this new position, and you have like a, a peer review, and, and this is really difficult to reach the last step that is the full professor uh, step. So, if you start with 11,000 and the money that the governor receives every month is 23.6 thousand reais. 
So it goes from 11 to 23 or 24. And then you have to deduct the tax. This is free of tax. Although this is including the tax, which is really much worse. So if you don't, if you don't change this, the, the, the career, our career, will not be attracted anymore to young people like you. You can make more money in, in, in the industry or in another place uh, outside the university. So this is, in my opinion, is, is, it's the terrible thing that we, we are suffering right now. And, uh, and of course, the brain drain, this is going to be, the, in my opinion, the most. It's not because we cannot do hard science and very good science in Sao Paulo. That's, that's not a big issue here in the state of Sao Paulo because of the three universities and FAFESP, but it is because of the career. And I think this country did the same of, uh, with the professors of the elementary and, and high school. I, 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 they, it's, I, I feel like really upset with this because of professor, and I'm a professor, I like to teach. I like to transfer to people, especially in a developing, in a developing country as Brazil. I could have stayed in the States as some friends of mine, but I decided, no, I got money to come here. I have to return to my country and try to increase the quality of our institutions. So if you don't do that, we are going to be in the next decades as the same as the professors, as the teachers of elementary and high school receiving very low salaries. Anyway, sorry to tell you that in this, <laughs> in this, in this meeting, I'm answer. And I'm talking about that to the, to the, uh, to the people at the, the executive, like uh, vice governor, governor, secretaries, and even in the parliament. This is really important to say. Um, the second part of your question, I, I'm going to ask you to say it again. The University of Newcastle in Australia, of course, and this is the prejudice that you mentioned, because in the mission, usually, and I think we have a lot of people work on diplomacy here, uh, we visited, when we visited Australia for the first time, uh, who indicated the universities was the government of Australia. So we visited the group of eight, that you, you must be aware of that, it's the eight, and also we visit some of the technology, the technological university, such as uh, QUT and uh, the University of Technology of uh, Sydney and, and so on and so forth. But in the next time, we, we, we plan to go and maybe you can talk and include the University of Newcastle in this uh, program together with the uh, University of Queensland. Um, and uh, it's, it is possible to have a higher education free of tuition and stipends and any kind of fees. This is, this is a very important uh, question right now in this country. I've, I've no, I don't know if you, if, if you are aware of that. Uh, the new government, they want to start to, to charge uh, higher education in this country. Using the Australian model, when I, in, in my, first, my second visit to Australia, I remember uh, in one meeting at the, the Australian National University in Canberra, and there was this professor from this university who was in charge of having this uh, uh, system uh, in Australia to charge students, and, they, and then they return uh, the payment when they paid the tax the, the after, I don't remember the percentage of, uh, if, if you get a, a better job, you pay more, if you get a, a, a not very good job, but then if you change the job, you increase your salary, and you are supposed to give it back to the, to the country, to the government, uh, much more money. So, there was a PhD student 
a Brazilian PhD student in, this, in the section doing a um, um, collaboration with this professor. And uh, I said, look, in Brazil, we have a constitutional issue. To change this, you better start in Brasilia, because you have to change the constitution to be able to charge uh, uh, education here, even higher education. So we have the constitution issue uh, that's protecting from, from, from what you mentioned, that it's really possible to, to keep the university uh, uh, without charging students. And as you can see, you are in the oldest, you are in the best university of, of Brazil, that is the University of Sao Paulo. And as you can see, uh, uh, the students, they come here and don't, then they don't pay anything to study here. In my opinion, what we are doing, the three of us, we are trying, because of course, as you know, the population pay tax, and the tax come here. And of course, the politicians, they think 13, only to the universities, is, uh, is, uh, the budget is 11, 11 uh, billion of RIs, only for the three of us. So this, of course, the politicians would like to put this money in other uh, uh, important things. I, I, I agree that we do have a lot of good, important things to, to waste or to use our money, but it doesn't work that way. So, um, what we are doing right now, we are bringing uh, students from high school, from public high school, and, and then we, we are trying to show to the population that here we do not have very uh, only rich people, you know, because this is, this is funny in Brazil. The very good high schools are private. Usually, the fathers, they put the children, uh, their kids in private high school to be able to be selected in one of the three public state universities, like uh, the three of us. This is, so we have these uh, comments in the, the population that you must be rich to be able to be here at the University of Sao Paulo, University of Campinas, and, University, and Sao Paulo State University, my university, and this is not the truth. This is not the truth. So I think bringing, right now, we are bringing at least in, in my university, 50% every year, we selected from uh, students from public high school and the other 50 from private schools. And it's the same exam. Even in the, in the very uh, difficult course that is the medicine, the medical school that is in Botucatu, and we have like last year, not this year, was like 313 competing by one position at the medical school. Even in, in that school, we have 50% of the, of the students from public high school. And what is really important, we are doing this for, we've been doing this for five years, so now we have the results from the, um, from the, uh, the students that drop off the university. And, uh, and the result is the same. The students from public uh, high schools and private high schools, they are, even in a very difficult course, they are doing okay. And they are not leaving because they are not being able to, to pass the exams. So that's, that's what we are, doing, we are doing right now. But maybe in the future, they are going to change the Constitution and we are going to be forced to charge the, the, the students uh, in, in, in higher, um, at least in higher education, but uh, it will not solve the problem. And this, we, we know that around the world, we know that, that and it's not a problem of, I, it's not an ideological problem, because for instance, in China, you, you, you pay, you pay a lot. And in Germany, you don't pay, or you pay just a little bit. So uh, that's 
political answer to you uh, 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 right now. And I think doing that, that's why I believe we need to align our goals with the United Nations and try to focus and solve problems that are common here in Brazil uh, in all developing countries and, and not developing countries and that's, that's my opinion. And I really could not understand you, the second part of your question, if you remember. Oh, sure. We, we, I'm, I'm, I've been uh, president for two years and a half. And, of course, we decided to have an alumni. And with, uh, with, with at l mainly to keep in touch, in touch with the alumni, but also to prospect very good donors for our uh, endowment. So, and I'm really happy because of doing that, uh, we have the, the meeting of the Senate of my university on Thursday, and the father of one student in one of the, our units in Rio Claro, he got in touch because he knew about the alumni and this policy to ask your, uh, for donation. And philanthropy is really important in other countries. We don't have this too much in Brazil. We, we have to develop. And he called us and he, he said, look, I have a company. Uh, I'm not rich, but I'd like to give to NASP 35,000 local currency reais every year because of my, my daughter. Uh, uh, she's a student, she's a student of NASP in Rio Claro, and I'd like to contribute. I know that it's been really hard to survive during this crisis, but I would like, with the low amount that I have, I'd like to give the university and help. So this is really important, and I think keeping uh, this connection with alumni, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very important. I think University of Sao Paulo has one alumni, I'm, um, alumni system, and I really don't know if Unicamp has one too. But we. We, put in, we start this uh, last year, and we are now uh, having the results, very good results. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, briefly, uh, we had the first uh, Professor Marcelo Noble from Unicampi that showed us that internationalization and innovation I can go very well together by presenting two concrete cases where proposals for internationalization are not the, from the usual uh, uh, drawer, something which is, as he mentioned, out of the box. Professor Vahan provided us with, uh, besides uh, some brief presentation of the university, obviously, but he provided us with uh, conceptual, uh, uh, the conceptual aspects that uh, 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 direct uh, the work both of internationalization, quality, and innovation, uh, third mission of the university. And Professor Sandro Valentini uh, was so kind and very open to make a very uh, precise analysis of previous experiences of internationalization uh, such as uh, Science Without Borders that we discussed also this morning extensively and, uh, uh, and CAP Sprint and, the, and the, what, was, uh, what are the new uh, uh, approaches and how the universities uh, not only would like but they demand and correctly that they should participate in order to have better uh, results with scarce money. And now in the last uh, round of questions uh, I thank especially Professor Sandro Valentini not only for staying uh, uh, longer, but also because we opened um, a, 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 a box with uh, critical uh, institutional and existential questions for the university and for society. And thank you for being so, uh, uh, I would say, so uh, clear in your answers and uh, presenting what you really uh, think and uh, problems 
are really important and not, uh, we cannot uh, finish the discussion here. The subject, as, as Bernard Shaw says, the subject is not exhausted, but we are. And so uh, we are now going to conclude this special session uh, of uh, our uh, school uh, in innovation and science diplomacy. Thank you, Professor Amansi, once again for organizing together with Pedro and the whole staff uh, this uh, event. And uh, maybe you have some last message, uh, some managerial message for everybody. I have a coffee break. <laughs> Just two um, important informations. First one, uh, Amancio already said, is the best one, coffee break. After the coffee break, we are going to meet at IEA to the negotiation framework, conceptual framework on innovation diplomacy at 5.30, okay? And please, I would like to ask to those students who got a card that allowed the entrance in the building to return it when exiting the facility, okay? Thank you very much.